our economy post-COVID, and, and I'll sit down to give another member a chance to speak. Suzanne Webb. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I welcome this debate about the mother of all refurbishments. This building is the very fabric of our democracy. The building is steeped in such architectural and political history. It is the very bastion of egalitarianism. How I felt as a newly elected MP walking into the palace is hard to put into words. Every single day I feel that sense of history that this building represents and the bond that it has with the fabric of this great and united nation and those who have gone before me. But what strikes me most is how much this building, this great place, means to those who work here, to the clerks, to the doormen, the staff that make this place run, to those in the tea room who make the best jerk sauce on this earth. Their dedication, their loyalty, their own sense of history and purpose of being here, their pride. They are truly the law custodians of this great place. We should also not forget this building stood tall and towered over COVID-19. No matter how it has tried to change our world order, no matter how vindictive it has been, it did not overthrow democracy, and here we will all remain. For me, it is COVID-19 that unlocks the answer to what we need to do. That is, we must continue debate, we must continue the scrutiny of government, that we need this great place to remain open to ensure this continues. For me, this isn't just a refurbishment project about bricks and mortar. It is, the it is, in fact, the mother of all workarounds. It is a project to ensure this great symbol of our democracy remains every single day. I hope the way forward will be the mother of all workarounds, protecting one of the world's most recognisable buildings, protecting democracy. But whatever we do, we must do it prudently and safely. This is the mother of all parliaments, which has stood tall for over 900 years, and long may it stand tall for another 900. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Andy Carter. <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, and I will be very brief, yeah. and yeah. thank you for calling me. It doesn't matter who you talk to in any part of our United Kingdom, or for that matter, many countries around the world. The image of the Palace of Westminster, the Elizabeth Tower, it's the first thing that comes to mind when you talk about a parliament. This isn't just another building project we're talking about. It's a project to preserve the seat of democracy yeah. and to renew this place for many years to come. Now, during normal times, this place attracts thousands, no, millions of visitors. And one of the incredible things about being here in our workplace is that occasionally it feels a little bit like a zoo as well people looking in at what we're doing. That's a good thing. That's democracy in action. We must preserve that. And I'm very much of the view, in the same way that we care for our statues and monuments around the country, we must care for this historic palace because it is of global importance for generations to come. The frustrating thing as a new member of parliament is we've been talking about this for 20 years. Now we need action. <laughs> After 20 years of dis discussion, and having seen what happened to Notre Dame, we must not disregard the danger of not taking this action soon. We need to see value for money, but we also need to see speed and care, and a workforce drawn from the United Kingdom that can bring great craftspeople to this place to create a great place again. I conclude, Madam Deputy Speaker, by saying to the parliamentarians and public, we can see how this investment will benefit the future of this parliament and will benefit the future of this great country. Yeah. Yeah. Valerie Vaz. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, and uh, the leader and I are keeping our, have kept our remarks short to, to enable more members to come in. But uh, I would just say to, thanks to all the right honourable and honourable members who have spoken. Um, the sponsor body is the body that is going to look after our interests, and I have great faith in the right honourable member uh, uh, on, who are on the sponsor body that they will, and this is on a cross-party basis, that they will look after the interests of Parliament and costs, and they will keep that at the forefront. Um, in terms of uh, one of the honourable members mentioned the Elizabeth Tower, we didn't know what was going to be found in the Elizabeth Tower, and that's why the costs went up. And I would say about Richmond House, uh, I'm not sure, but I thought there was Legionella's uh, disease somewhere floating around. So it's important for us to, to look at what's going on there. Um, the review is important because members can feed in their views into the review. And yes, we are not experts, but they are experts. The uh, sponsor body and the uh, delivery authority do have experts on it. 
Many members have said uh, that we can't do the work because all the services are connected, and I would agree with that. We do have to decant somewhere. That may be for the sponsor body to uh, provide an answer. Now, I do feel sorry for new members because they haven't been part of the debate, but I think the models were shown to all of them at their induction day. So um, I think uh, it, they knew this was coming down the line, but, but I'm pleased that they, many of them have taken part in the debate today. We don't know the outcome of the review. Let's wait and see what comes up. Uh, and I just want to leave uh, with a quote from the Restoration and Renewal Programme's vision, and that is to transform the Houses of Parliament to be fit for the future as the working home of our parliamentary democracy, welcoming to all and a celebration of our rich heritage. To coin a phrase, let's get going. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I obviously can't respond to every point that has been made, but if there are any points that have been made that require a response, I will write to honourable or right honourable members. May I encourage those members who didn't get called to speak to send in their speeches to the challenge panel of the review board um, so that their views are uh, on the record as far as this project is concerned. I think that is very important, and if there are any members who have left the chamber already, I will try and make sure they are notified of that suggestion. And I will also send a copy of today's Hansard to the challenge body so that they will get the views of all honourable and right honourable uh, members. I think this has been an excellent debate. We have seen a lot of new thinking and developed thinking, some fresh thinking coming from members who got in in 2019, which I think is extraordinarily helpful. And I think two things are absolutely clear. One is how proud we are of this extraordinary building, and we have heard Churchill quoted about how we make our buildings and then they make us. That comment is so absolutely right, and how proud we are of this magnificent building, symbolising the democracy which we cherish and the pride we take in it. But the other thing that we realise is that in a time uh, of economic difficulty, we cannot spend vast amounts of money without ensuring that there is value for money and that everything that is done must be done with value for money in mind. And if we have to take a little bit of inconvenience, so be it. The question is that this House has considered restoration and renewal. As many as that opinion say aye. 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 The contrary, no, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. In order to allow the safe exit of honourable members participating in this item of business and the safe arrival of those participating in the next, which is the statement. I'm suspending the House now for three minutes.
Order. Can I just say, I was asked for a statement this morning. This speech arrived at 16.59. I don't think it's acceptable, and I'm not sure when the opposition got theirs. But as I was asked this morning, I would have thought there would have been better preparation in ensuring the opposition got it and my good self. So if you can bear that in mind, because it was given with the urgency that was needed, so a little bit more attention to detail to make sure the speech is shared will be helpful. Right, let us come to the Secretary of State for Health. It's really shaking head, it's one of those things, it's fact. Matthew Pancock. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. With permission, I'd like to make a statement on our action against uh, coronavirus and the decisions we've been taking through the day today uh, to um, determine the future of the action needed in Leicester. We continue our determined fight against this invisible killer. The number of new cases yesterday was 642, lower than when lockdown began. And according to the latest figures, the number of deaths in all settings is down to 66. We are successfully turning the tide. And part of this success lies in our ability to take action locally whenever we see it flare up. Often, this is on a very small scale, swiftly and quietly, like in an individual farm or factory. But when needed, we, need, we also act on a broader basis, as we've done in Leicester. And today I wanted to up update the House on the situation in Leicester. At the end of June, we made the decision to close schools and non-essential retail in the city, and not to introduce the relaxations that applied elsewhere from the 4th of July, like the reopening of pubs. This was not an easy decision, but it was one that we had to take. At that point, the seven-day infection rate in Leicester was 135 cases per 100,000 people, which was three times higher than the next highest city. And Leicester was accounting for 10% of all positive cases in the country. This decision was taken with the agreement of all local leaders, and I'm grateful to the leader and officers of Leicestershire County Council and to the officers of Leicester City Council for their support and continued hard work. Since then, we've doubled testing in the city and through a monumental programme of communications and community engagement, we've been pushing our important messages. I committed to reviewing the measures in Leicester every two weeks. This morning I chaired a gold meeting of the Local Action Committee to discuss the latest situation. And this afternoon I held a further meeting with local leaders, Public Health England, the JBC, the Local Resilience Forum and my clinical advisers. The latest data show that the seven-day infection rate in Leicester is now 119 cases per 100,000 people, and that the percentage of people who have tested positive is now at 4.8%. These are positive indicators, especially in light of the huge increase in testing in the local area. But they still remain well above the national average and the average for surrounding areas. Thanks to the incredible efforts of people in Leicester, who followed the lockdown, even whilst others across the country have had their freedoms relaxed. We have, we're now in a position to relax some, but not all, of the restrictions that were in place. So, from the 24th of July, we'll be removing the restrictions on schools and early years childcare, and taking a more targeted approach to the restrictions on non-essential retail replacing the national decision to close non-essential retail with a local power to close them where necessary. This is all part of our more targeted approach. However, other restrictions, like those for travel and only having social gatherings of up to six people, for example, were, will remain in force. And measures introduced on the 4th of July, like reopening the hospitality sector, will also not yet apply. The initial definition of the geography covered by the lockdown was a decision I delegated to Leicestershire County Council and they made and published. The leader of Leicestershire County Council, Nicholas Rushton, has advised me, based on the data and the best public health advice, that he recommends these restrictions now apply only to the Oadby and Wigston area of Leicestershire as well as the city of Leicester itself, and I have accepted his advice. Some say that the local lockdown is unnecessary. 
I wish this were true. But sadly, it may, remains vital for the health of everyone in Leicester and the rest of the country that these restrictions stay in place. We will review them again in a fortnight. I hope that this careful easing of restrictions will provide some comfort to people in Leicester and Leicestershire. And I'd say this directly to people of Leicester and of Leicestershire, I pay tribute to you all. Your perseverance and your hard work has brought real and tangible results. And you've shown respect for one another. I understand this hasn't been easy. Strong representations have been made to me by my honourable friends, the members for Charmwood, Harborough and South Leicestershire, and for the members opposite who represent the City of Leicester. On behalf of constituents who have been impacted, the constituents who wanted to see the lockdown lifted too, however, there is still a lot to do, and the public health messages remain critical. So please, get a test if you have symptoms. Keep following the rules that are in place. Please do not lose your resolve, because the sooner we get this virus under control, the sooner we can restore life in Leicester and across the country to normal. Mr Speaker, this statement also gives me the opportunity to inform the House of an issue relating to testing. We have identified some swabs that are not up to the usual high standard that we expect, and we will be carrying out further testing of this batch. As a precautionary measure, and while we investigate further, we are requesting that the use of these Randox swab test kits are paused in all settings until further notice. This problem was brought to my attention yesterday afternoon. We contacted settings using these swabs last night and published the pause notice immediately. Clinical advice is that there is no evidence of any harm, that test results are not affected, there is no evidence of issues with any of our other test swabs, and there is no impact on access to testing. Mr Speaker, our ability to take action on this local level in Leicester is the keystone of our plan to defeat the coronavirus so we can keep this virus on the run and defeat it once and for all. I am grateful to you for allowing me to make a statement at this time, and I commend the statement of the House. Shadow Secretary of State Jonathan Ashworth to reply. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, just before turning to Leicester, could the Secretary of State perhaps update the House and, and comment on Patrick, Sir Patrick Francis's remarks at SAGE? Who advised today, or, or said SAGE, I beg your pardon, who at the Select Committee advised that SAGE had advised the government to implement lockdown measures as soon as possible on 16 March. So why did it take a further seven days for the government to implement lockdown if SAGE was advising on the 16th of March? Um, can I start by putting on record my thanks to the City Council and all the health officials, particularly our Director of Public Health, Ivan Brown, for all the work they are doing to drive our infection rates down. In Leicester, I welcome the extra testing capacity that we have received as a city, including the door-to-door -door testing, and I want to put on record uh, my tribute to the people of Leicester, the city where I live, for their fortitude in doing all we can to drive this infection down now through 17 weeks of lockdown. We still have to make, if we still have to make further personal sacrifice to keep people safe and hunt this virus down with the lockdown, then so be it. But there is no question there will be a degree of dismay across the city uh, in response to the Secretary of State's remarks. We welcome the uh, opening of non-essential retail, but there are many businesses who were, were preparing to open their doors for the beginning of July who are still cannot open their doors, and they will want to know whether they will get any specific extra business support. The Secretary of State suggested uh, in the previous statement that they would. The business, sec the business minister ruled it out. The continued lockdown coincides with the traditional Leicester fortnight. I don't know if the Secretary of State is familiar with the Leicester fortnight. It's the two weeks in July where our schools break up earlier than other schools across the country, uh, and it's a time when many Leicester families will have booked holidays. But of course, they can't go on holiday because they're not allowed to, and many travel companies are refusing to, to uh, pay them compensation. Uh, and so on. So can he guarantee that, that they will not be out of pocket because they are not allowed to go on a holiday that they've saved up all year, for, for all year round? Can he, the government step in or can he force those travel companies to reimburse those Leicester families? As he knows, Leicester is a city that suffers from high levels of child poverty, insecure work, low pay, lack of decent sick pay. 
we have many deep-rooted economic problems, and the spike in the city, or the, bit, the larger outbreak in the city, seems, appears to coincide with these inner city areas where we know there's high levels of de deprivation and uh, uh, o overcrowded. We also know we have a large ethnic minority community, so can he explain why he's not yet implemented the recommendations of the Public Health England report into protecting those from minority ethnic backgrounds? And of course, there has been widespread speculation about the garment industry. Uh, can he tell us how many HSE inspections and how many HMRC inspections have now taken place in Leicester's textiles factories, particularly since the Home Secretary a couple of weeks ago promised us she would stamp out any illegal exploitation. We note that he has rejected the advice of the city mayor of Leicester to partially ease restrictions in parts of the city, although he's taken advice from the leader of Leicestershire County Council to ease restrictions in part of the county. Could he perhaps explain what the public health uh, evidence is behind that decision? Because if the public health advice uh, is to maintain, for example, the lockdown in the west of the city, when we know the infection rates are at the highest in the east of the city, why does that not advice also apply to the neighbourhoods that border the city boundaries? This is one greater urban area. So what is the public health reason why someone in one side of Gilmorton Avenue, I don't expect him to know Gilmorton Avenue in my constituency, but it illustrates the point. What is the public health reason why one per, when, a, when someone living on one side of that avenue is now subject to restrictions because they fall under Leicester City Council, but they presumably are not allowed to cross the road now to speak to their neighbour who lives opposite them because they fall under Blaby District Council? There are other examples across the city as well. Uh, so if he could offer us that advice, I think we would appreciate it. Now, of course, Leicester uh, went into lockdown because, uh, uh, because of the infection rate and because it took so long for us to get us the specific data. Local authorities are still complaining that they are not getting the patient identifiable data and they're not getting data on a daily basis and they're not getting contact tracing data. The Prime Minister yesterday at Prime Minister's Question said we have a world leading system, the best system in the world with testing and tracing and it will avoid a second spike this winter. But we know there have been problems with this testing and tracing throughout. Last week it was revealed that he's been overstating the test numbers by 200,000. Sky News revealed that. Today he's come to the House and we're grateful for him updating the House uh, about what's happening with Randox. I believe this is a £133 million contract that was given to Randox with no, without any competitive tender. Could you just explain what is exactly wrong with these kits? How many of these presumably faulty kits have been used? Is there a health risk to anyone who has been tested with these kits? And how many, well, well I'm going to put myself in the second position, there isn't a health risk. The, 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 the government are withdrawing these kits. And how many people have these unsafe kits been used on? And why wasn't the certifications uh, checked before these kits were used. These kits tend to be used in many care homes. We want care home residents to be tested regularly. We want care home staff to be tested regularly. How, can he guarantee that those care homes will now get alternative kits rapidly? Uh, and just finally, today we've seen uh, the broader uh, testing, uh, more testing data has come out today. The Prime Minister promised that tests would be delivered within 24 hours by the end of June. I think the figures today show only 66.9% of them are. On the trace, tracing data, we see that only 71% of people are being contacted, uh, uh, not the 80% that we were promised. And isn't the truth that we've got, now we've got swabs being recalled, we've got uh, uh, t contact tracing uh, the data not meeting the, uh, not meeting the targets. We've got circle call centres with people uh, not doing anything, and it's all costing £10 billion. and he's now bringing in Mackenzie's. Why is he throwing good money after bad? Why doesn't he invest in public health services, primary care, and local health, health teams instead to do this testing? Uh, Mr Speaker, um, the right on gentleman has spent uh, weeks complaining about capacity to do things like contact tracing and now uh, complains that we've got too much capacity and I think he should decide uh, on, a, uh, on, a, on a position and stick to it. Uh, on the point on um, certification, or on Randox and the, uh, and the kits that we've put a pause on, um, the reason is that they had a 
uh, a CE stamp and upon investigation of the certification of that stamp, the certification was not forthcoming and therefore uh, physical checks uh, were done and we found that the swabs weren't up to the standards that we uh, expect. This is limited to the Randox element of the testing system, not the broader uh, testing uh, system that we have. Um, and I said, uh, I explained the clinical position, which is that there is no evidence of any harm having been done and that there is full access to testing because we have um, plenty of other uh, test kits available. He asked about test and trace. 99% um, of the uh, tests uh, that are done, that need to be done quickly, are returned uh, the next day. Um, he asks about the, um, uh, the more broadly, um, about uh, the comments of the Chief Sci Scientific uh, Advisor uh, to the Select Committee. Of course, the 16th of March is the day when I came to this House and said that all, that all uh, unnecessary social contact should cease. Um, that is precisely uh, when the lockdown was started, and uh, so I'm glad that we've. Got, I'm glad that uh, it's unusual to be attacked for saying exactly the same as the chief scientific advisor. Um, on the um, questions res with respect to Leicester, um, he rightly raises the Leicester fortnight, and schools have effectively um, risen for the summer um, in Leicester already. Um, of course, I would urge uh, holiday companies uh, that people in Leicester have, have booked with uh, to reimburse people in Leicester who might have booked a holiday at this point. He mentions the problem and the challenges of insecure work in Leicester. He's absolutely right to do so. This is a very long-standing problem. Uh, I, I think we, across the Hell House, would strongly support action to ensure that uh, illegal insecure work is stamped out. Uh, my colleague, the right on, my right on friend, the Home Secretary, is taking action uh, where that is appropriate. Uh, but of course, the public health response is vital. Uh, finally, he asked about the public health advice on uh, geography. Um, given that there were uh, no cases in many areas of the county that are part of the conurbation of Leicester over the last week, um, it was, I think, a reasonable recommendation to me by the County Council um, to lift the lockdown in those areas. Uh, I gave the, um, the, the Mayor of Leicester the opportunity to put forward uh, any changes he might, want, might have wanted to uh, within the city boundary, uh, but he declined to do so. And I think, based on public health across the whole city of, uh, of Leicester, within the city geography, incidence of this disease is higher uh, than, uh, it, that, uh, than a sustainable level and we absolutely need to bring it down uh, and that's the uh, basis uh, on the advice and working uh, with and listening to uh, local leaders that we took the decision uh, of the geography of the lockdown in Leicester and I finally end again by paying tribute to people in Leicester uh, who are enduring this lockdown longer than, longer than others. Uh, it is their fortitude that will help get their city safe again. We're now heading to the Chair of the Select Committee is Jeremy Hunt. Jeremy Hunt. Thank you, Mr Speaker, for special dispensation to ask this question remotely. I want to ask the Health Secretary about the worrying variation in coronavirus mortality rates between hospitals, which appear to range from 12.5% to 80%. Now, there may be some issues of deprivation or ethnicity, but some of that variation is likely to be a failure in some hospitals to adopt best practice, which is what the Getting It Right First Time programme led by Professor Tim Briggs does. So I wonder whether he would agree to meet me and Sir Tim to discuss whether the Getting It Right First Time programme could help reduce COVID mortality rates going forward. Mr Speaker, I'd be very happy to to meet uh, my right honourable friend and Professor Tim Briggs, who does an incredible job. He's a, uh, a brilliant public servant uh, who's done great work uh, on the Get It Right First Time programme. Um, as my right honourable friend knows better than almost anybody, um, the uh, unjustified variation in performance between different hospitals within the NHS 
is a huge issue across the board uh, because if the standards in every hospital were the same as the standards in the best hospital, the performance of the whole would be so much higher. Uh, that is exactly what the Getting It Right First Time programme uh, was designed uh, to, uh, to, to, to deliver. Uh, it was instigated by my right hon. friend and I'd be very happy to listen to what both he and Professor Briggs have got to say. I said to Scotland and visit the SNP spokesperson, Dr Philippa Whitford. Dr Whitford. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Directors of Public Health in England are still complaining they're not getting the information they need. They only started to get area data from late June, when it became clear that Leicester had had 900 cases in less than a month. Within a week, Leicester was back under lockdown. The Prime Minister has described this as his whack-a-mole approach to controlling COVID. But does the Secretary of State recognise that for the people of Leicester, this has felt just as bad as the national lockdown? I've raised many times the issue of test results from the UK government labs not being sent to GPs or local public health teams. Is it true that this was not even specified in the contract? Even after Leicester, and despite COVID being a notifiable disease since the 6th of March, local authorities and health protection teams in England are still only being sent anonymized area data, which is of little use to identify clusters. And it's only being sent on a weekly basis, which is far too slow. Does the Secretary of State not accept that public health teams need daily data with both work and home postcode details so they can spot an outbreak? and they need individual test results so they can isolate all those involved to break the chains of infection and prevent further spread of the virus. I know he rarely mentions isolation, but surely the Secretary of State knows it's actually isolation that breaks the chains of infection. But this should be the affected individuals, not a whole society or a whole city. The test and protect system in Scotland has been up and running since the end of May and was able to disrupt a cluster of just 12 cases in the south of Scotland. That's the level of detail required to drive an elimination strategy. He says local lockdowns will be the cornerstone of his ongoing strategy, but how does he plan to deal with the social and economic impacts? And will he not join the devolved and Irish governments in following an elimination strategy to avoid repeated local lockdowns? When does he envisage having a fully functioning test, trace and isolate system in place across England? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I'm terribly sorry, I'm not going to be able to answer all of the points that were made, uh, but all I can say to the Honourable Lady is that I'll send her an update on the data that in England uh, local uh, directors of public health uh, get, because the, there's been a huge amount of progress uh, since the, many of the situations that he described. Um, no, I bow to no one in my uh, desire to use data to make uh, policy and to get the best data out, and we've been getting better and better and better data out to local areas. We've been publishing more and more and more data, uh, and um, I've, and um, many of the comments that she made were out of date. Richard Dolphin, Mr. Speaker, uh, out there in the country, confidence, confidence that we have a clear path out of the global coronavirus pandemic is absolutely key and confidence that the government will take the right but necessary and sometimes difficult decisions for us all is also key. And I think we've seen some of that today with these two decisions that the Secretary of State has taken. On behalf of my constituents, can I thank the people of Leicester for the perseverance that they are showing. But will the Secretary of State assure me and my constituents in North West Durham, in fact the whole country, they will not hesitate to take similar decisions like local lockdowns if necessary in the future. Uh, yes, of course, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the, the, the need for local lockdowns is one that we don't ever have to uh, want to have to bring in, but it is important as a tool in our armoury uh, to be able to tackle uh, outbreaks where we find them. I much, much prefer local action to be on individual specific, whether premises or an individual uh, uh, surgery or in, in, a, in a, a more targeted way. I also pay tribute 
uh, to uh, Blackburn with Darwin Council, uh, who have done a, a, a very good job of bringing in local measures when they saw their numbers going up uh, before they got anywhere near to uh, where uh, Leicester got to. And the local council there have done a, a, a terrific job. So it, it, it is absolutely vital that we have this local action um, and that we take this local action and we won't resile from taking it. Uh, and, uh, but having said that, we also recognise the impact that it, of course, has on, on the people and the businesses involved. Monira Wilson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Today, Sir Patrick Vallance told the Science and Technology Committee, it's clear that the outcome has not been good in the UK. I think you can be absolutely clear about that. So whilst I'm delighted that the Prime Minister committed to my right honourable friend, the member for Kingston Surbiton yesterday, that we will have a future independent inquiry, we need to learn lessons urgently now ahead of a second wave, not least following the warnings in the Academy of Medical Science report earlier this week that suggested we need to rapidly improve test and trace capacity and our PPE resilience. So will the Secretary of State tell the House today what is he doing to make sure we learn up from our mistakes? Secretary of State. Madam Deputy Speaker, we, we're learning uh, all the way through about how best to respond to this uh, virus. Um, and in fact, may, changing measures such as the changes that we've made in Leicester today are a good example of learning from the progress of the virus, learning um, about how best to tackle it. And um, that's just one of a myriad of ways in which we're learning and improving all the time. Chris Bryant. I want to ask the Secretary of State about the revelations that the Americans and the Canadians have come up with in relation to Russia trying to um, break into the vaccine um, testing regimes in their country and possibly in the UK as well. How secure are we ensuring that, we, uh, that, these, um, test it, uh, that the vaccine process is in the UK from cyber attack from elsewhere? And is there anything further that we need to do to make sure um, that other countries aren't looking on this as some kind of stupid competition. We're all in this together, aren't we? Absolutely. Our, our approach is that the vaccines that are developed uh, in the UK, uh, supported by UK government and ultimately UK taxpayers' money, um, are there, of course, to provide protection should they come off to the, uh, to the UK population, but so too to the population around the world. And we're using our ODA money uh, to help ensure that there's broad global access uh, should they work. Uh, with respect to the, um, uh, the, the question about uh, cyber security and potential hacking, he'll understand why I can't go into full details, but I, I can reassure him uh, that the National Cyber Security Centre is taking this very seriously. Sir Bernard Jenkin. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I return uh, to the question of public confidence? And can I thank my right honourable friend for the tireless way that he submits himself to scrutiny by parliamentarians and the press? But will he uh, accept that the public does want to understand more clearly what mistakes were made and what lessons have been learned? And can I invite him perhaps to at least table a written ministerial statement before the rising of the House next week? that sets out the key lessons learned and how they are being implemented as we go into the autumn, which could be another very testing time for our country. Well, I'm very, I'm very, happy. I wouldn't, uh, I'm very happy to do that. I wouldn't um, uh, uh, deny the chair of the liaison uh, committee um, his wishes in that, and I'm looking forward very much to appearing before the Science and Technology Committee uh, next week to answer any questions that they might have. Stephanie Peacock. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. What does the Secretary of State say to the man in Barnsley who, when asked if he was contacted by Test and Trace, if he would isolate, he said no. And when asked if he got COVID symptoms, he would isolate. He said he'd have to think about it, but probably not. And when asked why, he said, because if he doesn't go to work, his kids can't eat. This is the stark reality for many people in this country. So what is the government doing to make sure that people have the financial support so they can follow the government guidance? Yes, but the Honourable Lady asks an important question, and it's a question that we address by ensuring that there is local support available, in particular when there's a... Uh, a local lockdown and of course there's the statutory support that's available and uh, good employers uh, will ensure that people are supported. Our overall principle is that people shouldn't uh, be penalised for doing the right thing and the thing I'd say to him is please get the test and if you're asked to isolate, isolate uh, and make sure that you seek the support that's available. 
Nigel Mills. Many of my constituents are a little confused where they'll have to wear masks in public places from next week. So could he just confirm once and for all, if they go to fetch a, a takeaway, will they have to wear a mask or not? Uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, if people go to a shop, then it will be mandatory from the 24th of July uh, to wear a mask. If they go to a hospitality venue, then it will not. Dr Lisa Cameron. Many thanks, Madam Deputy Speaker. As Chair of the Disability All Party Parliamentary Group, I'm concerned by results from Charity Scope, who have undertaken research showing one in five adults with disabilities have said they will not leave their house until a vaccine for COVID is developed, and just 5% said they'd feel safe when shielding is paused. So what steps will the Secretary of State take to ensure people with disabilities are protected, but also given confidence to resume their lives after lockdown? so they don't uh, slip further into social isolation and loneliness. Um, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Lady uh, raises an incredibly important point and has raised this point rightly before. Um, and it, it's, it's so important uh, that, especially as we lift the shielding measures at the end of this month, the people who have been shielding have the confidence to know that the reason we are able to lift those measures is because the rate of transmission of this virus is so, uh, is so much lower now uh, and that it is safe. Indeed, it is recommended uh, that they go out and about. And there are there's many charities, including many who we funded through this crisis, um, who are available uh, to help and to support people in these circumstances. Uh, she's right to keep raising this issue, and we must keep working on it. Rob Butler. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, can my right honourable friend assure me that lessons will be learned from the experience of the councils in Leicester and Leicestershire, to, to whom he has rightly paid tribute, uh, to ensure that all local authorities, including Buckinghamshire Council, receive all of the detailed information that they'll need from his department in the form and time frame that they need it, so they can then take action to protect their local populations? Yes, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And my honourable friend has raised this point with me both. Uh, but privately as well about access to this data. It, it, it is incredibly important. Uh, we're constantly improving the data that's available uh, because we're constantly getting better data. That is an important part of the work strand. Janet Davy. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, we cannot praise enough carers, key workers and NHS staff during this pandemic and, of course, in Leicester. My constituent, Anthony Francis, launched a petition for a national day of recognition for our NHS and key workers. He proposes the 26th of March, which was the first day of CLAP for our carers. The petition reached over 100,000 signatures from across the country. Will the Secretary of State commit to this? Well, I'll certainly look at it. It seems like a very, uh, a very interesting idea. I think Clap for Our Carers was a uh, absolutely brilliant uh, initiative. I love the fact that it was uh, essentially a, you know, it was, it was a, it was a social initiative. It didn't come from government. We embraced it enthusiastically and all went out clapping, as did everybody. And uh, a way to mark that um, uh, permanently uh, is something that I'm absolutely open to. Angela Richardson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. On Monday morning, I will be attending the opening of the brand new Guildford Ward at the Royal Surrey, a 20-room, fully equipped with CPAP isolation ward built in just four months. Will my right honourable friend join me in congratulating both the pragmatism shown by the local council and the forward planning of the hospital? And does he agree with me that in the event of a localised spike in cases requiring hospitalisation, the Royal Surrey will be well placed to deal with it effectively? Well, yes, uh, Mr. Madam Deputy Speaker, the, um, my my uh, my honourable friend uh, is a great champion of the Royal Surrey at Guildford, and that the hospital has done a brilliant thing by, in uh, short order, expanding its capabilities uh, in this crisis. Uh, as have many other hospitals around the country. One of the positive things that's come out of it has been the dynamism and flexibility of parts of the NHS and their collaboration with, the, uh, local, with local authorities. And both of those have risen to heights never previously seen. Um, and um, I, I, I hope that we can bottle that best practice and make sure that we keep a dynamic, flexible NHS that works collaboratively with local authorities long into the future. John Speller. 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I accept that today we do have to have a focus on Leicester, but can I revert to the General? And can I ask the Minister, during the recess, to prepare a national plan for recovery to announce when we reconvene in September? And does he accept that we may have to face up to the fact that we have to contain, but we may have to co coexist with the virus? Because we are facing, over the summer, a tsunami of job losses and business closures, and we will have to get Britain back to work. Well, um, the, the, um, the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely spot on in highlighting the two vast challenges that this country faces, that every country faces, which is an unprecedented health challenge and an unprecedented economic challenge as a consequence. Uh, both of these are uh, extraordinary, uh, and uh, the rising to each of them uh, and making sure we deal with each of them as best we can is at the heart of every single government across the world. Peter Bowen. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, can I congratulate the Secretary of State for coming to the House first and updating us on the situation in Leicester? This week, there was a report from the Centre for Social Justice saying that we have 100,000 modern-day slaves in this country. Now, it appears that many of those are in Leicester and have unfortunately created this high infection rate. What is the government going to do to look into this matter? And if this is happening, clamp down very hard on the people that are causing it. Ma Madam Deputy Speaker, the allegations that the uh, Honourable Member uh, makes are ones that have been widely made um, and are widely understood to be uh, a potential part of the problem. Uh, I, I speak uh, carefully in terms of the language uh, because I know that there's ongoing uh, operations, uh, both to deal with the public health problem and to, do with, to deal with uh, other uh, illegality. And it is, it, this is a sore that has long gone untreated and undealt with in Leicester. Uh, and it is absolutely vital that we add national resources uh, to make sure that we get to the bottom of this problem in Leicester once and for all, both the public health response and dealing uh, with some of the uh, potentially illegal employment practices that many people have raised. Jim Shannon. First of all, can I thank the Secretary of State for his statement on the health update for Leicester. Um, in relation to masks, I fully understand the need to wear a mask when you travel on the, on a bus or a train or a plane as I do twice a week here and as everyone else who travels that I've seen also adhere to. But there is uncertainty in wearing a mask and that is now perfading the discussion uh, and there is uncertainty. So we need to bring the general public with us. So does the Secretary of State not agree that the government message on masks must be clarified as many people are questioning the appropriate time and the appropriate place to wear a mask? Madam Deputy Speaker, it is going to be by the 24th of July mandatory to wear a mask uh, in a shop, uh, in, uh, on public transport and in any NHS setting and then it is uh, recommended in a broader uh, set of uh, settings that's based on, the, uh, based on medical advice and also on the, 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 the judgment that we want to also bring confidence to people that they can and uh, should go shopping, because, precisely because of the economic benefits that that brings that were raised just a moment ago. Andrew Percy. Thank you, Speaker. Medical nutrition has been vital for the treatment of COVID patients in hospital, but it's also vital for those requiring to be fed by tube at home. During this period, uh, GPs have not, uh, due to them working remotely, been able to uh, use the electronic prescription service uh, in the most appropriate way. That has meant that many of the providers of medical nutrition have run up huge uh, prescription debts. That's a risk for the future. So will the Secretary of State look at what can be done to ensure that the supply of these vital medicines can continue? Um, uh, yes. uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to my old friend for raising this question, because both because it's important uh, but also because in many places the electronic prescription uh, was absolutely vital to getting through uh, uh, the COVID period. So I, I want to know of the examples that he raises where that has not been able to be used uh, during the crisis, because in fact using this sort of digital technology has been part of the way that we've got through it in many parts of the country. Sam Terry. 
Madam Deputy Speaker, Leicester's Director of uh, Public Health said that getting the information needed about the outbreak in Leicester, data and so forth, has been particularly challenging. And this is of interest, particular interest to my constituents in Ilford South, given the demographics of Ilford South, very remarkably similar, you know, large ethnic minority populations, many South Asian constituents. And as we know from the recent Public Health England review, we've seen a disproportionately number of deaths from COVID-19. So I'd like to know directly from the Secretary of State, what's he doing to get less of the information and data they need, but also every borough, including mine in Redbridge, that information as well. Yeah. Uh, this is incredibly important, and um, as I said before, I bow to nobody in my enthusiasm for, uh, for using data to inform better decision-making. Hence, we've been constantly improving the data that's been available, both at a national and at a local level. Uh, and there's now very sophisticated uh, systems in place to ensure that the directors of public health can get that information. Uh, and um, we're constantly improving the information that's available, uh, both for those who have statutory duties and have signed uh, data protection agreements who can have access to uh, 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 the, uh, much more information, and, of course, uh, publicly, uh, where, it, uh, where it doesn't uh, give away confidential information about individual people. Sir Graham Brady. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, the Secretary of State, I know, is working on a package of support for care homes with an unusually high rate of vacancies due to a lack of applications uh, at the moment. But can I impress upon him the situation is becoming desperate for some. In Trafford, the number of vacancies is now 160. A week ago, it was 147, an increase of nearly 9 per cent in a week. Can I ask him to give those homes some hope by communicating when they can hope to hear about the support package? Uh, I, I, all I can tell my right hon. friend who has uh, pushed on this point uh, repeatedly is that this is uh, vital and ongoing work inside, the, uh, inside government. Barbara Key. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The fourth annual leader report on the deaths of people with learning disabilities was published today, and it showed that people with learning disabilities continue to die prematurely and from treatable causes. And since March, nearly 40% of the deaths notified to the leader process were linked to COVID-19, and that compares to a quarter of all deaths in the UK. Now, this is a group of people who've been let down by our health and care services, who die 22 years before their peers and are now dying disproportionately from COVID-19. Will the Secretary of State look urgently at the 10 recommendations in the leader report and consider what can be done to reverse this tragic loss of decades of life for people with learning disabilities? Yes, of course, it's an incredibly important report that she, uh, that she rightly uh, references and a system of annual reports that we brought in precisely to bring these things to uh, public attention. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that it also, uh, to also be able to report that the number of people with uh, learning disabilities and autism uh, who are in secure settings um, has fallen quite significantly uh, over the past few months as well. It's, it's a connected area that I know that the Honourable Lady takes a great interest in. Dame Cheryl Gillen. Madam Deputy Speaker, can I um, offer my support to the Secretary of State, who's been working tirelessly um, during this crisis? Um, epilepsy Society is a major charity based in my constituency, and they say that people with epilepsy are affected adversely by COVID-19, particularly as the fever associated with coronavirus can trigger an increase in the number of seizures and cause breakthrough seizures. Despite this, the Secretary of State will know that people with epilepsy are not classified as clinically vulnerable for coronavirus or the flu. So in fact, they do not qualify for either the free flu vaccine or any future COVID vaccine. Will the Secretary of State look into this and ensure that this is remedied as soon as possible so that we can protect this very valuable cohort of people? Madam Deputy Speaker, my um, right honourable friend is, a, is an incredibly strong voice uh, for uh, those who suffer with epilepsy. Uh, and um, what I can commit to her is that I will ensure that the clinical uh, decision makers who, are, who make the recommendations on the uh, order of priority for any vaccine, both flu and coronavirus, 
um, take a specific look at the latest evidence on epilepsy. I cannot give her the, the guaranteed assurance that she seeks because these are rightly decisions that are uh, taken on the basis of recommendation from clinicians, and I wouldn't want to break that principle because it's, it's, it's a very important principle. But what I can do is ensure that the latest information, including on the impact of coronavirus uh, on those with epilepsy, is taken into account in the, uh, in the, in the decisions. Now, just before I call the next person, let me appeal for quick questions, not statements. And then if the questions are quick, the Secretary of State, who's been most assiduous in answering thoroughly, will be able to give quicker answers. Neil Hanvey. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. A learning culture is the hallmark of any robust patient safety strategy. Being able to own, reflect on and learn from past errors is a defining characteristic. Across health and social care, that tone is set by the Secretary of State himself. So when concerns such as those of Professor John Edmonds about the loss of life relating to the timing of lockdown uh, are raised, it behoves him not to be dismissive, but to take them seriously. How can clinical staff and the wider public have confidence in his leadership when they can readily fact check that his assertions were wrong. Uh, well, the, that's a bit of a. The last bit was a little bit broad. Uh, I mean, not all my assertions uh, have been wrong, uh, but um, I do learn and try to learn, and indeed have uh, discussed uh, openly some of the things that went uh, badly as well, and, and wrong and wrong judgments as well as. Uh, things that have gone uh, well. Um, and uh, I've referenced, for instance, the fact that when we first brought in guidance around funerals, it had the impact of people, too many people staying away, spouses who might have been married for uh, 50 years. Um, and, uh, um, and we changed that, and, and that was an error. So um, absolutely the learning culture is important, and it is important that it's set uh, from the top. Uh, and I'm very happy to be open about the errors that I and others well, I've made, others can be open about their errors, uh, and, um, and let us learn. But I also think it's important to be robust where you think you've made a decision correctly. Hello, Wheeler. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, will my right honourable friend commit to using the experience of what's happened in Leicester to inform future measures in other areas, uh, with particular ruling on what essential workers should be able to keep working with all the appropriate safeguards, such as our high-class engineering companies in South Derbyshire or elsewhere. Secretary of State. Yes, and um, in fact, it links to the previous question because one of the things that we learned from Leicester is that um, we had the um, uh, the power to be able to close non-essential um, retail across the city, we have now, as or, um, we will now take the power to enable the local council to close, lo uh, to close non-essential retail uh, where it is necessary and therefore take a much more targeted approach. Uh, this, is, this allows us to fight the virus, but with a lower impact, negative impact on business. So we're constantly seeking to improve the tools at our disposal, in this case, legislative tools at our disposal, uh, in order to fight the virus. Zara Sultana. Thank you, Madam Deputy, Deputy Speaker. This afternoon, the government's chief scientific advisor revealed that the SAGE committee urged the government to impose a lockdown on the 16th of March, a week before it did. The Secretary of State has just suggested that he responded by advising people to practice social distancing on that date. But advising people to socially distance is not the same as imposing a, so a lockdown. That week-long delay could have cost thousands of lives. So I asked the Secretary of State, why did the government fail to act when SAGE called on it to? And does the Secretary of State regret this delay? Um, it, it's, it's, she's trying again. The front bench opposite said this. Um, uh, on the 16th of March, I said to this House, and it was welcomed by the front bench opposite, Today we are advising people against all unnecessary social contact and others and with others and all order, order. don't shout at the Secretary of State. He's answering the question. Secretary of State. Thank you very much. Um, what I said on the 16th of March was today we are advising people against all unnecessary social contact with others and all unnecessary travel. Uh, that that uh, is uh, that is when the lockdown truly started. <laughs> Uh, Alicia Kearns. 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to my right honourable friend for the actions he has taken, which have isolated the virus and protected nearby areas like mine in Rutland and Melton. On behalf of our neighbours in Obi and Wixton, can my right honourable friend confirm these decisions are being made based on scientific data and that the city and council county councils have a significant voice in the decision making process? Yes, absolutely. The decisions that we've taken in Leicester are based on the data. Uh, based on the best public health and scientific and clinical advice and in consultation with the local um, leadership and, um, I'm, uh, and, and hence the decision uh, to uh, ask the advice of the local leaders uh, in terms of the geography of coverage um, and make sure that their, um, that their insight, uh, that we asked for their insight and I, as I said in my statement, I, recommend, I accepted those uh, recommendations. Um, as we've seen right across the country in local um, action, councils have got such an important role, just like we've seen in, in Blackburn and Darwin, where they took the initiative themselves to take the action that was needed. I pay tribute to the, what the council did there, because it, 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 uh, I hope it will stop that, um, that, their council area getting into the position that Leicester got itself into. Afsal Khan. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It was shockingly clear at the PMQs this week that the Prime Minister had not read the report commissioned by his government on the worst case scenario for a second spike of coronavirus that suggests upwards of 120,000 hospital deaths. Given the seriousness of this report, can the Secretary of State confirm that unlike the Prime Minister, he has read it and what steps he is taking to implement the recommendations of the report to prevent a catastrophic second spike of the virus? The, the report is an incredibly important report in making sure uh, that we look at all of the, we cast ahead and look at all of the challenges that face us uh, ahead of us. Uh, but. Uh, it, it took the assumption that there would be no action from government uh, should the R go to 1.7. Uh, but it's the stated policy of the government uh, not to allow that uh, to happen. And so whilst it was a worst case scenario based on, um, uh, uh, based on a, a set of assumptions, uh, we are constantly vigilant. Dr Luke Evans. Uh, thank you to the Secretary of State, and I appreciate his answer to several of his questions about the learning that he's done, because 10 days ago I asked him about information for the people of Hinckley and Bosworth who live in Leicestershire. They want to know where the boundary is and what the implication is of any changes. Would he be kind enough to point out exactly where that boundary is, and for the people who are now out of lockdown, what that means in the measures they are taking, so there is a clear message that they can take home tonight? Very happy to give that, uh, that answer, uh, which is very clear. Uh, for those who are uh, in the city of Leicester and in Odeby and Wigston, uh, then the measures that are set out, releasing uh, on the 24th of July uh, the, uh, the closure of non-essential uh, retail, uh, releasing the closure of schools and childcare facilities, but keeping uh, all of the other measures in place, that is the position. For those who are not in those two specific areas, uh, they uh, return to the same measures that the rest of the country um, is, uh, is living with, uh, except, of course, that we'll keep higher, the higher vigilance, the higher testing and the communications uh, in those areas. And the decisions on this uh, geography was taken on the advice of uh, local council uh, leaders. Um, and um, I, I, I've seen whilst I've been on my feet that the Mayor of Leicester has uh, made some comments around this. I, I did ask him uh, if he wanted to put forward a uh, different geography within the city of Leicester, and he, uh, he declined to do so. But we work very hard, as, as closely as we can, with Leicester, and especially with the public health officials in Leicester, who are doing an absolutely uh, valiant job in difficult circumstances. West Streeting. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On, on lessons learned, given the circumstances in Leicester, does the Secretary of State for Health agree that the government made a terrible mistake in cutting the health and safety executive's budget by 48 per cent and by instructing the HSE to reduce inspections in the textiles industry by a third? Yeah. 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 
I, I haven't seen those uh, figures, but what I do know, but what I do know is that local councils have an incredibly important responsibilities in uh, in in this in this space, and, uh, and 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 we will now act. We will now act to make sure that we can we tackle uh, some of the challenges that we find, especially in Leicester. Jane Hobbs. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, I welcome the targeted new approach to business clo closures in the local lockdown area. However, the current lockdown has affected businesses both within the lockdown and outside it, the area because people have decided not to open for fear of an unmanageable number of people coming to their establishment. Can the Secretary of State look to offer additional support for these businesses? Well, the, the support that's available nationally to businesses, which is uh, incredibly generous, is of course uh, available to those outside uh, the areas in question. I do understand the impact on businesses, both of course within Leicester, but also more broadly. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and all I can say is that that national uh, support is available to all. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Over the last few weeks, I've exposed the significant risks of COVID-19 in some of York care homes. These findings have wider application. Measures in the Coronavirus Act, poor decision-making and poor governance have undoubtedly led to increases in infection and mortality. And there are serious questions over the recording and reporting of deaths. Will he or one of his ministers urgently meet with me before the recess to discuss these tragic findings so lessons can be learnt and lives saved? Very happy to uh, ensure that the social care minister um, we, has uh, in, uh, meets the honourable lady uh, in, uh, in, in as soon as possible. Greg Clark. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Secretary of State is assiduous and energetic in making himself available to uh, answer questions at all times, and I'm grateful that he's agreed to come before my committee next week, so that we have longer than we would have had today, uh, given the statement. Um, in March, we didn't have the testing capacity in place to cope with the volume of testing that was needed, and it took until May to get it. Sir Patrick Vallance has said to the Science and Technology Select Committee this afternoon that we don't currently have the testing capacity needed for the coming winter. So will the Secretary of State guarantee that it will be available long before then, uh, and that we don't repeat one of the principal mistakes uh, of the current pandemic? I, 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 I was uh, heavily and personally involved in um, making sure that there was that uh, rapid increase in testing uh, capacity uh, back then, uh, and I'm absolutely determined to ensure that the testing that we need for this winter is available. We have plans in place to deliver it. Of course, it, that needs to be built. Uh, it isn't there now, uh, but it will be built. Even if there are no breakthroughs on testing technology, which will make testing much easier to access, um, even if there are no breakthroughs, we have plans to ensure that the testing capacity that's necessary for winter will be available by winter. Andrew Gwynn. Thank you. And can I thank the Secretary of State for his statement? We know there are distinct areas of the country seeing local rises in cases. So can he explain what urgent steps the government are taking to increase testing in these areas? And with indulgence, as someone who's on week 17 of long COVID viral fatigue, can I also ask the Secretary of State what additional resources he's committing to NHS support services for those who are bluntly struggling to recover from the virus? Deputy Speaker, I, I'm very sorry to hear that the Honourable Gentleman uh, is suffering from uh, post-viral fatigue. It is a very significant problem for a minority of people who had coronavirus, uh, and uh, my heart goes out to him because I know how debilitating it can be. Um, and um, I'm glad to say that we have brought in uh, an NHS service, and I'll make sure that he get, has access to that uh, service, as should anybody who's suffering from the uh, from the symptoms of the, the fatigue that comes to, to some. Uh, and also, I've put just under £10 million into research uh, to make sure that we get the best possible treatment. Uh, it's an area that's very close to my heart. Angus Brendan McNeil. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, at a statement on July the 7th, uh, the Secretary of State agreed with me that 80% of positive cases are asymptomatic and he would use his use capability for testing of asymptomatics. Now, unless we patrol for the virus today, it is Leicester, but tomorrow it will be somewhere, somewhere else. And one serious gap for many communities are workers returning from as merchant mariners or oil rig workers. Now, people are mostly routinely tested going on to oil rigs, but routinely are not tested 
coming off oil rigs. Uh, and I know of some oil rig workers who've tested positive, having taken tests for various reasons when they've come off. Now, I wonder if you will commit that returning mariners, and especially those coming off oil rigs, are tested, because we know that there's a danger and a gap we've got left open that unchecked people may be unwitting asymptomatic coronavirus carriers. And can you do something to close this gap, please? To, to look into that, we have a number of surveys to find out where are the highest risk groups by occupation um, and to put in place asymptomatic testing uh, to, address, uh, that, uh, to address that risk. Uh, of course, uh, many uh, oil rig workers come ashore in Scotland. Uh, the UK testing capability is significant on the west coast of Scotland, uh, in Inverness, in Aberdeen. Uh, and elsewhere, and um, I'd be very happy to work with my uh, counterparts in the Scottish Government uh, to, uh, to, 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 to test the hypothesis that he proposes. Felicity Buckham. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Will my right honourable friend update the House as to the steps Public Health England is taking to ensure that we are ready in the winter time if there is a second spike? Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, my uh, honourable friend is quite right to ask about this, but it's not just Public Health England. It's right across the board taking steps in the NHS, taking steps uh, in uh, test and trace uh, to grow capacity and contact tracing and the testing that uh, our right honourable friend just um, asked about, um, making sure that, for instance, uh, we need to know that the uh, uh, that the, that the capacity is there uh, right across the board. And uh, Public Health England have their responsibilities, uh, but so do we all. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'm delighted that the Secretary of State uh, for Health is so keen on data. My local CCG tells me that they're still not getting the right data to GPs. It's quite clunky, and, they think, and they're right, I think, in saying that GPs can see comorbidities, so it's particularly important they get data about people who've been tested. And we have an outbreak in my, the north of my borough now, and we don't yet have the full postcode data. So we have the postcode data, rather, but not the full address. This is isolated to households, and it will stop local lockdown if we can actually help get that very, very precise location. Surely the tra track and tracers are getting that data. Can they get that to local authorities so we can handle this locally? I will, I will personally ensure that all of the data that we have on her borough uh, is uh, made available to her borough, subject to a data sharing agreement, which I think is in place with Hackney, um, to, um, uh, so that they can best address this. It, if, it may be that we don't have data that is being sought, um, in which case we can, uh, we, we'll be, it will be straightforward and open about that, but, and also we might want to have a discussion about whether we can get any further data uh, that's necessary. Andrew Bridgen. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I commend the Secretary of State, the Department of Health and the people of Leicester for their, their heroic efforts to suppress the virus in the city and prevent widespread further infections across the country? However, can my right honourable friend comment on the levels of support and cooperation he believes these vital efforts have received from the Leicester Mayor Sir Peter Salisbury and from the Labour-controlled City Council? Uh, well, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have been working very closely with the, uh, with the City Council. The officers of the City Council have been doing a heroic job. Um, I just think that it's, it, it, it's best if everybody pulls together and everybody tries to come together to tackle the virus. Um, and uh, given that we've involved local leaders in all of the critical decisions, uh, and, uh, and, in, and indeed, um, it, it, I think it's best if people just try, try uh, to stay on the same page as much as is possible, um, no matter how hard some people seem to find that. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Secretary of State, two of the recurring themes today from your statement have been uh, people asking that we... Order, order, even at this late moment, would the Honourable Lady please address the Chair, not the Secretary of State? Please. Uh, I do apologise, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, would it be possible, as we look at the lessons that we learn from the first wave of this and the threat of a second wave, and the fact that the British public have been so keen to thank those working on the front line, we've talked earlier about the clapping for the NHS, would the Secretary of State consider using his influence with the Home Secretary 
to offer those migrants working in health and social care in this country the right to remain indefinitely? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, absolutely, we uh, enormously value all those who work in health and social care. And just this week, I was able to uh, say that the exemption from the immigration health surcharge has extended right across uh, the uh, uh, right across those who work in health and social care. And I think this demonstrates the value that we uh, that we place on them. Finally. Robin Miller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. My sympathies are with the people of Leicester. In North Wales, we continue to experience the low levels of infection that characterise a flat topped curve while containing local workforce outbreaks. And I put my thanks on record for the care workers and staff at Betsy Cadwallader Health Board for tackling the different challenges this kind of outbreak presents. History teaches us great tragedies present opportunity for innovation. The great fire of 1666 gives us the origins of our fire service and modern insurance. Can my right honourable friend give us any hope that any advances will come from this tragic pandemic? Uh, well, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, I, I, I am a man who is an unashamed uh, optimist, um, and it's difficult sometimes to be an optimist in the middle of a global pandemic. But I'm glad for the chance uh, to answer my honourable friend's wise question uh, with some enthusiasm, because we have, amidst this great tragedy of this pandemic, seen some big steps forward. Um, the use of um, telemedicine and improved ac access to medicine uh, for so many people uh, by, um, by use of technology is one example. Uh, the advance and the march of British science, which has uh, led the world in terms of the development of uh, the discovery of the first um, drug known to reduce the impact of uh, coronavirus, um, but also across the board in terms of our, the scientific work uh, that's gone on. I talked earlier about the flexibility and the system working in the NHS, which have got to be the hallmark of the future of our, of our um, NHS. There's just three examples off the top of my head. Uh, but there are myriad others, and amidst this dark cloud, Madam Deputy Speaker, when we see a, a shard of light, uh, we must take great hope from it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. First of all, I can say what a pleasure it is to have you in the chair on a subject matter that I know that you have great interest in, Deputy uh, uh, and, and Madam uh, uh, Speaker. I, I'm also very pleased to, to have an adjournment debate. Um, I usually intervene in adjournment debates, but on this occasion uh, I'm, I've actually got the adjournment debate, so I'm very, very pleased to have that. I, I want to put on record my thanks to Mr Speaker. Uh, for, for making it possible. Uh, I know this is due to his forbearance and interest in this matter. Uh, and When I, I spoke to him about it some uh, uh, week or ten days ago, he was obviously quite intrigued as well to see what was going on and also wanted to, to, to ensure that this House had a chance to, to hear the story. Uh, and Obviously, we were very pleased to see the Minister in his place. Um, the Minister and I have been friends uh, coming to this House at the same time. Uh, we've been friends. Uh, we've done our Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme together and many others, and, and I'm very, very pleased to see him in his place and look forward to his response. I'm also very thankful, Madam Deputy Speaker, to be um, privileged and, and also the honour and honour to be the MP uh, for Strangford, which boasts much rich heritage and history, with Grey Abbey being noted as the best example of Anglo-Norman Cistercian architecture in Ulster. Founded in 1183 by the Afrika, the wife of John de Corsi, the Anglo Norman invader of East Ulster. Poor and decayed in the late, late Middle Ages, the abbey was dissolved in 1541, but in the early 17th century was granted to Sir Hugh Montgomery, and the nave was refurbished with parish worship until the late 18th century. The south edge, uh, east edge of Newton Ards, where uh, the substantial remains of a, a Dominican friar founded in 1244 may be viewed, they are the only ones of their type in Northern Ireland. Built by the Savage family, the buildings were destroyed by Sir Brian O'Neill to prevent English soldiers using them. Sir Hugh Montgomery restored the church in 1607 at a small chapel, but it fell into despair in the middle of the, of the uh, 18th century. We also are blessed uh, to host the St. Patrick's Trail and remember the legacy of St. Patrick, the British missionary to Ireland, 
and as many of the abbeys that were erected as, it, as his legacy exist only as ruins and relics. You may wonder why I'm bringing up the history of these churches, but the reason is clear. Although they were designed as houses of worship, they are now wonderfully rich pieces of history, having lost their true purpose. And it would make my heart ache to see world-renowned St. Margaret's, the church here, the parish church of, of Westminster, become another wonderfully rich old building that is not fulfilling its true design as a house of prayer and worship. It's also our church, Madam Deputy Speaker, as, as our discussion had the other night, and very clear uh, that it's the church for the MPs and the peers as well. Absolutely got it to re- receive notification last week that services were to be halted at St. Margaret's. As the time has passed, I say that I'm not the only one to feel this way. And I thank every person who has signed the online petition with over 1,300 people asking us to be able to make a way forward to enable this church to be a tourist attraction as well. Because if we, if we look at the background, it clearly is a part of the ceremony of this place, of the House of Commons and the House of Lords, but also to do what it was built for, to be a place for seekers of Christ to meet and worship him. This is what the congregation are asking for. And that is what I am asking in this place and looking uh, longingly and beseechingly to the minister for that purpose that we facilitate them as best as we can in ensuring that the cost of these churches, which are tourism attractions but also places of worship, can remain open. I think of St Mark's Church in Newton Ards in, in my main town. That beautiful historic building is a real central hub in the town with children's work, work for disabled people, women's institute, men's group and a thriving community hub whose primary aim remains to glorify God. This is what we need to see in churches throughout this land and the fact is that something completely out of our control, COVID-19, has put some of these things in jeopardy. means that we need to step in and step up as we have done in almost all facets of life affected by the coronavirus pandemic. And I thank government and put it on record, uh, my my eternal thanks uh, and long lasting thanks to them for all that they have done. I'm very pleased to see the, the Honourable Gentleman for Estrus in his place, and I know that he wants to, to have a, a couple of minutes to make a contribution. Uh, if, if, if the Minister uh, uh, is happy with that, I'm very happy to let that happen. Uh, it, it's some pressing matters for, uh, that are similar to what I'm asking for, but for his own uh, constituency of Ipswich. Church tourism is a massive income generator throughout the UK. If we consider that four World Heritage Sites in the UK specifically include church buildings, Durham Cathedral, Westminster Abbey, Canterbury Cathedral and Fountains Abbey. Of the 16,000 Church of England church buildings, 4,200 are listed Grade 1, representing 45% of all secular or religious buildings listed at this grade, and a further 8,000 are listed Grade 2. There are 340 listed buildings of national importance in the care of the Church's Conservation Trust. And other listed faith buildings include 622 Roman Catholic churches, 537 Methodist, 306 Baptist churches, 69 congregational, 28 synagogues and one mosque. So the, 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 the multitude and the magnitude of what we're asking for uh, and, and those that are implicated in this is, is great. A further for 146 ecclesiastical sites are in the care of English Heritage or the National Trust. Statistics for English tourism reveal that 50%, 55% of all day trips include at least one visit to a cathedral or a church, the third most visited of all types of attractions. The church tourism is phenomenal and one of the largest attractions. Our own Westminster Abbey, which incorporates the markets here just uh, to, to our left here and outside the, the House of Commons, um, uh, has uh, an enormous amount of visitors each year, uh, creates a, a revenue which uh, sustains Westminster Abbey and sustains its markets. So what, what we do need, I believe, is some help uh, uh, and assistance. Um, the, the, the amount of revenue that is, cre- uh, is created through the visitors to uh, uh, Westminster Abbey and St Margaret's is somewhere in the region of a loss which it could be of nine to twelve million pounds. Um, it, it's, it's, it's enormous uh, and I know that I, I did speak to the Secretary of State about this. Um, I always feel a bit guilty, Madam Deputy Speaker, when you, when you, when you sort of say at tea time or, or at meals and you go over and you say, I'm sorry to bother you but could I ask you? Um, and and, and it's, you, 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 you sort of nab the, the opportunities and then you sort of say, hope he didn't mind me doing that. But he didn't. Uh, and, and, and I'm very pleased uh, to see the Minister in his place to answer. The North West Faith Tourism Scoping Study uh, estimated that 17 million visits to 45 cathedrals and 52 places of worship. 
it has been suggested, and this is Mar- this is a incredible figure that adds up the, to the church tourism that each parish church typically uh, receives around seven hundred to four thousand visitors each year. Um, I, I, I um, w- w- what do um, also refer to that tourism absolutely provides revenue to keep these wonderful churches, which we need regular work carried out and may have smaller congregations open and working. We understand that the congregations and churches and, and across the whole of the United Kingdom, Great Britain and Northern Ireland ha- are decreasing. And not just because of COVID-19, but COVID-19 exacerbated that. Uh, it took away the revenue streams that, that, that they have. Um, I, I mean, I, I was what, reading in, the, in one of the papers there one day that um, one of the churches, uh, Church of England churches here, uh, said he had about 150 people in his congregation. Uh, and when he went on to, to, to virtual, he had 25,000. Uh, people who who watched. So there are other ways of doing churches. But speaking personally, Madam Deputy Speaker, I love going to church. I probably always have, uh, or nearly all my life. I, I went because my dad made me go when I was a wee boy. But I now go because I want to go. Uh, and I believe it's important to have the fellowship, to have the communion, to have the chance to pray, to worship, and, and do that in fellowship with other people. Um, I'm very much a people person, always have been. Uh, I find Zoom incredibly hard to get used to. Uh, I find virtual parliament extremely difficult, uh, but I love coming here and intermingling with people, uh, and, and, and that's important. The issue uh, to me was highlighted by members of St. Par- Margaret's Parish Church uh, who are desperate to find a way through and retain their home parish church. I believe there's a way to retain weekly worship, and I believe this place, this house, this minister can facilitate that. There's been a church in the site of St. Margaret's next to Westminster Abbey since the 12th century. In 1614, it became the parish church of the Palace of Westminster. There's a regular congregation of between 70 and 120, and more than 250 on the community roll. We in this church, uh, sorry, this house, uh, when I first came here in 2010, um, I was made aware that there was a Holy Communion once a month in St. Margaret's. So that was my uh, uh, first attendance at the Church of England here in, in the mainland. But I look so much forward to that, uh, and we were lucky, we were fortunate to have a, an opportunity to do that, not in St Margaret's, but here in, in the house here, just yesterday as well. And I know that many MPs and peers look forward to that that um, that, that encouragement that we get on a Wednesday morning uh, over over a service, a Holy Communion, and then ultimately uh, until we can't have it at the minute because Mr Speaker's um, premises and house are being renovated. But when, when we do, we usually go there for breakfast, and it's always part of the occasion. Uh, part of the fellowship, part of, uh, of who we are. Services at the church are spiritually uplifting uh, and, and beautifully led by the priest vicars and the choral music is absolutely exceptional. Um, one of the things I've loved has been the, 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 the choral services which uh, St Margaret's holds for this, this house, for the House of Lords, for the House of Commons. Uh, we're very blessed in this house to have some wonderful singers, Madam Deputy Speaker, some of our Right honourable and honourable members have the most wonderful voices. Uh, I'm sorry, I just can't. I know their names, but I can't remember their constituents, so I'm not going to say it. Uh, I know that's not appropriate. Uh, but but the, I, I, I've witnessed some of their, their contributions in, in St Margaret's, and they truly, truly are uplifting. The congregation is made of an unusual mixture of local residents, employees at the Palace of Westminster, staff at Westminster School, members of Parliament, parents of boy choristers, enthusiasts for top class choral music, and many other congregants, some of whom come halfway across London on a Sunday to worship in St Margaret's. Not a week passes without a visit from a former chorister, or someone who was married at St Margaret's, or who remembers it from their time working in London. And, and I'm sure, Madam Deputy Speaker, you uh, personally, and I'm using that in the right term, uh, and us here uh, can, can understand because we meet people who have attended St Margaret's, who worship at St Margaret's, and they always say it's a wonderful occasion. Tourists are not usually part of the congregation, although they are welcome, but prefer to go to the Abbey instead. Sometimes the queues to get into the Abbey do not lend themselves to visitors being able to worship there. There absolutely is an acknowledgement that worship will change as every church throughout the land, and I understand that. But I honestly feel that aid from a specified, specific Churches Fund will enable the church to deal with the deficit caused by coronavirus and indeed perhaps new forms of income could be considered for during the week such as conferences or exhibitions during the week as long as Sunday worship was preserved. So the importance of Sunday worship is critical uh, for the churches uh, to, to, to survive and, and, and if financial assistance through the uh, the Culture, Arts and Heritage, 1.4 billion that government announced uh, uh, the week before last. Uh, if that was a, a 
able in some way to to help churches, whatever that way may be. It might be Madam Deputy Speaker through through the choral groups or through the choristers. Uh, there, there's a way of doing it, uh, but it's very important that we we, we maintain. Uh, St. Margaret's here if we can. I believe as a body that uses a church when the need arises, and we do in this house, uh, both houses, here and the other place, um, uh, and that we play our part, not simply uh, this, for this house, not simply to secure that place. However, there are also other historic um, churches who are able to stay open due to the tourism income that are struggling, and I believe we have a duty to protect them as well. So it's not only about St. Margaret's, it's not only about Westminster Abbey which are very important to us here in this place. But it's also about other churches, and, and the Honourable Gentleman from Ipswich will, will refer to his and his contribution in a short time. Um, I, 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 I must be remembered, before this time, these churches were viable, uh, and, and the congregations were larger. Uh, they simply need support at this time, and not in the long term. If we get back to normal, uh, if we get back to pre-COVID-19, and we can move towards normality. I, I have no idea, Madam Deputy Speaker, what normality is. I don't think any of us do. But we hope at some stage we will get back to normality and we can resume uh, the services in the church we've had. We can resume the tourism uh, and, and, and all the many different people and accents and voices and, and languages you hear whenever you, you walk outside of this place. So I, I, I looked at the CMS, who has striven to secure our arts venues. I very much look forward to the Minister's response, and rightly so and ask the historic churches, and on this occasion, our very own, as you and I have spoken, Madam Deputy Speaker, our very own St Margaret's receives the help that is needed to see her through this troublesome time. In this time of fear and despair, and with the mental health impact of lockdown and bereavement being very real, it's very real to me personally, uh, and I believe Madam Deputy Speaker, is probably real to every one of us who represents our areas and knows our people and knows the losses that there's been. I've had uh, two good friends who have died during the coronavirus, ever un unable to attend uh, both of their funerals, unable, unable to, to pay my respects personally to the family because of we were adhering to the 10 people at a funeral. Um, uh, we hope to celebrate uh, um, their lives at some later stage, and I believe we will whenever we get back to normality, but that's not just there just yet. So that bereavement is really real to us all. It is clear that the church has a vital role, and the church has, and our relationship with the Lord Jesus and our God, uh, also is, 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 is a, we have a role to play with that as central community hubs. People want to seek God uh, and his guidance and his comfort, and to attend church, church uh, Sunday services with prayer and worship that are a key component of this need, and we must, I believe, facilitate that and not see more churches falling uh, or failing due to something out of their control, COVID-19. So, Minister, look to you uh, uh, for the help, um, that we, uh, what can be done, uh, what will be done to secure not simply historic buildings, but vibrant and spiritually fulfilling church worship. Madam Deputy Speaker. Thank you so much for giving me the chance and the privilege to, be, to ask us in this house. Thank you. Minister, Mr Nigel Huddleston. Oh, I believe. Oh, I beg your pardon. Tom Hunt. Thank, thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I also want to thank the Honourable Member for Stranford for securing this important debate on the effects of COVID-19 on our historic churches. And I completely appreciate how the closure of churches used as places of worship have uh, been an incredibly difficult time for many people of faith. Ipswich has 12 medieval churches and six are still used as places of worship. But I want to use this opportunity to briefly touch on some of the other six which are now used to provide important community services. Churches such as St Mary on the Quay near the waterfront in Ipswich. After a bomb skidded into the Chancery in 1942, the church went unused for 30 years and was eventually vested in the hands of a redundant church's trust. With its fixtures and fittings moved to other churches, it was a shell of its former self, but it had a renaissance in 2018, to 2008, sorry, Madam Deputy Speaker, when funding was used to restore the church and give it a new life as a key place wellbeing centre run by a local mental health charity, Suffolk Mind. Unfortunately, though, Suffolk Mind had to take the decision last month not to reopen Key Place after lockdown, partly because of a loss of income caused by COVID-19. 
Key Place has been an important feature in our town since 2016, supporting many local residents, and it won't really feel like going back to normal without it there. I just finally talk also about the financial pressures caused by COVID-19 touching St Stephen's Church in our town centre, with the Borough Council announcing that the Tourist Information Centre located there won't reopen after lockdown. Even in the age of a smartphone, the centre was holding its own, selling theatre and coach tickets and advising tourists about it, such as many attractions. And it's a loss that this important and it's a loss that this important way of our town welcomes visitors won't reopen. Like St Mary of the Quay, St Stephen's Church faced a crumbling fate before its restoration in 1994. And the recent history of our local churches is a reminder that they have been through difficult patches before. But it's now up to us to not let them fall into obscurity again and find new uses for them so they continue to be at the heart of our community as we recover from COVID-19. Madam Deputy Speaker, all of our churches in Ipswich are invaluable, whether they are used for worship or places of community and they are fundamental parts of our town's heritage and Ipswich's story. We must not let the chapter of COVID-19 represent in that story mean that our great churches are allowed to gather dust and risk them not being there for future generations to benefit from them. So I agree with the Honourable Member for Strangford. Whether places of worship or places of community, particularly in Ipswich, which we know is the oldest town in the country, as much as Colchester might like to dispute that, we know how important our wonderful medieval churches are, so I'd urge the Minister to uh, um, provide support, if necessary, to ensure that we can keep those, those icons and those bastions of what is so important about our town. And now we have the Minister, yeah. Nigel Huddleston. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, firstly, my sincere thanks to the Honourable Member, the Member for Strangford, who is indeed a, a very good friend, um, for introducing uh, this debate today on this very important issue. As always, he spoke with great eloquence and knowledge about this matter, and I think his passion for uh, the church and churches uh, came through very clearly, and that passion we all know is shared by very many of our constituents right across the country. Um, I'd also like to thank the Honourable Member for Ipswich for uh, his